1 Corinthians 16. Uh, some people have gotten rather annoyed with me that I said that men are not supposed to get in touch with their feminine side. I've discovered that that annoyed some people. First Corinthians sixteen thirteen. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Get in touch with your feminine side. <laughs> Be strong. That's not what it says. Do you realize that to many professing evangelicals today, they probably will never now again preach this text. Because it will be offensive to their crowd. Would you have believed ever that this text would have been an offense? And now? Oh. Be on the alert. The devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And if that devil were to take a vacation in Palm Springs for the rest of your life, you would still struggle with sin. Be on the alert, outside and inside. And a great rule with regard to that is do not trust yourself. Be on the alert. How can you be on the alert? You know, sometimes I take somebody deer hunting and, and I go, look, look, right over there. There it is. And they're like, right there. And they're like, and you forget that as a little boy, you were trained. Don't look for a deer. Look for a little flicker of white. Look for something that stands out in that foliage, in that thicket that just doesn't belong there. So I'm seeing a little tip of white on an ear and I know he's there. And that other person says, there's nothing there. No, he's right there. Now, why is that? Well, from a little boy. Remember Timothy from a little boy? From childhood, you have known the scriptures. Hebrews, that we grow in our discernment by training. The book of Proverbs. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Do, do you see? How can you be on the alert? You can only be on the alert in the following ways. Number one, it's the word of God. You have to train your eye. You have to train your eye so that it recognizes. Whoop, there it goes. I remember when my, my little boy first read his first book on, on logic. Um, I think it was the fallacy detective or something. And we went and heard a preacher and we came back and I was like, oh my. A critic. My son goes, Dad, he committed two logical fallacies in his sermon. I said, okay, you're not studying logic anymore. <laughs> but that, you see, he wouldn't have been able, it, there were, there were fallacies. Well, one of them was, but there were fallacies. But, but my point is this, he wouldn't have known that unless he had read that little book, Fallacy Detective. But by knowledge, he was then able to discern. No, that was a deviation. He was alert to it. I mean, his ears popped up. And every little boy's a legalist, so he wanted to point out really quick that everyone was wrong. Um, do you see? The word of God trains your eye. Don't be like the man who has to see full blown sin coming at him, capturing him and eating him alive before he recognizes full blown sin. You need to be discerning. Read the word of God so that when that thing pops up, <clears throat> Kill it. Kill it now. Another way in which you're alert is in prayer. Paul talks about being alert in prayer. And Colossians 4 has the idea of being alert in prayer. We, we pray. We pray. We ask for God's help. We ask for God's grace. We could go on and on. But another way of being alert that is often overlooked is you can't stay up 24 hours a day. Someone else needs to take watch. 
one of the greatest kindnesses that the Lord has ever shown me. He's shown it to me throughout the great portion of my life is surrounding me with godly men. I'm going to choose to be around men that make me want to be more noble, that make me want to be more like Christ, that sometimes I walk away from them and I'm ashamed at my lack of maturity and my lack of spirituality, but it's not a shame unto condemnation. It's a shame unto motivation. So we are alert. We are alert. And how are we alert? Through the word of God, through prayer. And through others. Brothers, I've said this, I think, one other time since I've been here this last week, and that's this. Please do not fall into the error of thinking some people study the Bible because it's their gift. Or some people pray more than you because they just have that kind of disposition. One of the most helpful things I ever heard, I heard from John Piper. And its application to my life was unbelievable. And that was this, when, when I heard that he said, I have to fight for absolutely everything. And I've asked other men about this, men that I admired in the word, men that I admired in prayer and men that I've admired in, for their godliness. And you know what? For every one of them, it wasn't any easier to study the Bible than it was for me. It wasn't any easier for them to pray. They had to fight the same exact battles. Then what's the difference? They knew their life depended on it. I remember one of the greatest preachers you've probably never heard of is a man by the name of David Miller. Um, he, he's just one, I mean, um, still preaches. It's one of the, he's had such an impact on so many people's lives. And I was chopping wood for him one day because he's in a wheelchair. And I was chopping wood for him out on his hunting camp. He hunts in a wheelchair. <laughs> With big tires. <laughs> and uh, I was chopping wood for him. And I said. Because I remember the first time. That I heard him preach. He goes. he has a, I can't imitate him well. He's going to kill me for this imitation. But he's like. Turn in your Bibles. To Acts chapter 2. And so I did. And then he proceeded to read Acts chapter 2. About halfway through it. I realized. He wasn't looking at his Bible. He was just. Quoting Acts chapter 2 off the top of his head like it was nothing. And he could do that just about any place else. So I'm chopping wood one day and I said. I said, Brother David. God has really given you a gift of memory. I said, no he hadn't, Brother Paul. Don't talk like that. I just work at it harder than you do. <laughs> you see, I get. You, you think. I slam people. I get slammed so bad sometimes it's unbelievable. <laughs> but think what he said. He said, no. You know, when I came out of uh, whatever I came out of after about seven days and I like woke up and knew where I was. I felt like I'd been hit by a truck. It hurt so bad because of the machine they put on me that pounded me and pounded me to get my heart restarted three different times and went on forever, they said. When I breathed, I didn't want to do that again. It hurt so bad. And I can remember just concentrating. Just, just okay, breathe. Just go in and go out. I didn't want to breathe. But would have that have been a good option? You say, well, it hurts. Yeah, it does. Okay. But you got one other option. Die. You breathe or you die. You breathe or you die. You study the word or you die. You pray or you die. It, I'm, I'm sorry. That changes everything. It changes everything, doesn't it? 
if only that we could all take seriously, it would change so much in our lives. You read the word or you die. He goes on. Stand firm in the faith. You know, I love taking people to to um, Hebrews 11, 1 and, you know. Faith. Well, let's, let's just just look over there for just a second. I'll take it because there's no sense saying stand firm in the faith if you don't know what that means. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. I've always hoped to fly, hoped to fly unaided by machine. And so this morning I woke up with the great assurance that that I could fly. So I climb up on top of this building and I throw myself off with all the assurance in the world and I die. I have the conviction of things not seen. I've never seen anybody fly unaided, but I have the conviction I can do it this morning. So I climb up to the top of this building, and throw myself off with the greatest conviction and I die. But if you just take that one text out by itself, that's exactly what it's saying. But that's not exactly what it's saying, because you have to read it in the context of Hebrews and the context of the entire Bible. And and the thing that I want you to see that is so important. How can you stand strong in the faith? How can you even have faith? How can you have the assurance for something that you hope for? How can you have conviction of, of these things you've not seen? You've not seen these things. There's only one way. And that is you have assurance of things hoped for because God promised them in his word. You have the conviction of something you've never seen because God promised it in his word. And you as men cannot stand firm in the faith apart from the word of God. You cannot. It's impossible because faith is not a leap into the darkness. It's it's leaping upon a rock. It's trusting in what God said. And how can you trust in what God has said? How can you do it, gentlemen? How can you trust in what God has said? Only if you've studied what he said. Only if you've been in a church that proclaims what he said. That's all you can do. And, and listen to this. I love this is one of my favorite texts. It comes out of the, the servant songs. Of the Messiah and Isaiah. Just listen. Who is among you that fears the Lord. That obeys the voice of his servant. That walks in darkness and has no light. You know in first John it says that. If you walk in darkness. As a continual style of life. Not a Christian. So why is he saying here. That the one who truly fears the Lord, the one who truly obeys the voice of his servant, the Messiah, is the one who walks in darkness and has no light. It means this. that This is key to understanding almost everything with regard to piety. And you need to know this. This goes all the way back to the garden. There was no reason for Adam and Eve to look at that tree and believe that it would kill them. There was no evidence. It was beautiful. There was just no evidence. There was no evidence that that Abraham, when he looked at his body, there was no evidence that he was going to sire a child. He looked at his wife. There was no evidence that she was going to give birth to a child. There was you look around and there's absolutely no evidence with regard to that thing. And you see, that's the whole point of Genesis chapter three. And people oftentimes don't understand it. They'll say that 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 one sin brought the whole world into fallenness because it was against God and God is infinitely worthy and all that. It's true, but it, it was a huge sin because it all came down to the character of God. Who is God? You look at that tree, there's no reason to believe. There's no reason to believe that tree will kill you except for the word of God. And if you believe that word, you are affirming God is who he says he is. If you do not believe that word, you are literally saying God is a liar about the worst thing he could be a liar. And that is himself. 
It's a direct attack on the character of God. And so those who walk in darkness here are those who have their faith firmly set upon the word of God. They need no other stimuli. They need no carnal stimuli to worship. They don't need to get psyched up at some acquire the fire conference to go home to be good husbands. To be obedient. They don't even need to see temporal blessing for their obedience. Why? Well, it's very clear. Look what it says. He trusts in the name of the Lord and relies on his God. That's faith. So when it says stand firm in the faith. Do you know what it's basically saying? Stop calling God a liar if you want to look at it negatively. Brothers, sometimes I come across men who and we all. Who are attacked with doubting or something. But I want you to know that even though I'm going to speak kind words and I'm going to do this slowly, I try to do with most men what I do with myself. Unmask that doubt. That's not just a, a little man who's hurting and he needs me to put my hand on his shoulder and say, I understand. Doubt is a direct affront upon the character of God. And when I see doubt in my life, it just needs to be crucified. And it needs to be acknowledged as what it is. Unbelief in the character of God. Now, isn't it, isn't it amazing that he says here in verse 13, stand firm in the be on alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men. What does it mean to act like men? Be strong, be strong in what way? Be strong in being alert, be strong in standing firm in the faith. How do you act like men? You're alert. You're ever vigilant. You've got a family to protect. That's why I tell men, if you won't study for yourself, study for your wife. Do it for her. If you won't do it for yourself, do it for your children. They need a man. And a man isn't somebody who makes six figures. A man isn't somebody who can lift a building. A man isn't somebody who fights MMA. A man is someone who is able to stand alert at his post. To be vigilant with regard to his own heart, to be vigilant with regard to his wife, to be vigilant with regard to his children and to be vigilant with regard to his church. Realizing it's a battle. It's a battle. It's a battle. Men who believe their God. I've said this many times as a young man that was always very, very afraid that had gone with me into the jungle several times. And I mean, he's scared of his own shadow. Everything was going to bite him. Of course, everything would bite you there. <laughs> but the thing of what I appreciated about him so much was he went. He went weak. He went afraid, but he went. Why are you going, son? Because they need Christ. Because Christ needs to be glorified here. That to me is a man. That to me. Self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. Selflessness. The world doesn't revolve around you. Your family, your wife is not an extension of you. You have been called to serve. But we can't, we do, we will not have the character to serve. And we will not have the knowledge to serve. We will not be able to be biblical men. That means conform to the image of Christ. We won't accomplish any of that. If the word of God is not dwelling in us richly. If we are not in prayer. And if we are not in fellowship, not only with a biblical church, but with some really good brothers in that church. 
that will rebuke us, offend us. And if we get offended, kick us in the pants and laugh. I tell you, we've just become such a bunch of, I don't know. Kick us in the pants. We need it. We need to act like men. We need to be conformed to the image of Christ. Christ. 